So we're in Romans chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5 this morning as we continue a verse by verse look at the book of Romans. And so as we arrive here, let me read to you verses 1 and 2. We'll get into our study. Romans chapter 5, and we're going to begin by looking at peace with God. That's what Paul begins to speak to the Roman church about here in Romans chapter 5. So Romans 5, beginning at verse 1, reading verses 1 and 2, Paul writes, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, as we look at this passage, Paul is going to now begin to outline what would be called the benefits of salvation. And he begins to give to us the benefits of salvation by building on a doctrine that we've been looking at, a doctrine that is called the doctrine of justification. Now, he's been laying a solid theological foundation for the Roman church, and he's been outlining certain basics for them from chapter 1. So as we've gone from chapter 1 up to chapter 5, we know that he has been pointing out certain things. One, he pointed out that all humanity is under condemnation because of sin. He developed that by saying humanity would include both, both Jew and Gentile. He then went on to say that there is no escape outside of God deciding to completely forgive our sins. He made it clear that God's plan for forgiveness is based on grace and that this grace is revealed in the gospel. And then he was teaching this is not a new doctrine because that's how Abraham and David had been accepted by God. And so as he's been saying that, he had arrived at that word justification. And as we've been looking at that doctrine, justification, I was pointing out to you that justification is an act whereby God completely forgives us, completely forgives us of our sin. He cleanses us from all sin, not just some sin. And he does not hold those sins against us any longer. When you, when you get saved, God justifies you. It's as if you had never sinned. God cleanses and washes you. And at that point, you're brand new in the Lord. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us, the Bible says, from all unrighteousness. And that's what he does. He, he forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And as I was pointing out last time we were together, as we we're looking at the doctrine of justification, it is more than the forgiveness of sins. It's more than the removal of the guilt and it's more than the, the removal of the condemnation. It goes beyond that. It's not only the removal but it's also the imputation or the giving to you of something you didn't have before. And what he does is he removes our sin and he gives to us righteousness. That's all in justification. And the righteousness that you have is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, when Paul was writing to the Philippians in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, this is what he wrote. Paul said, yes, everything else is worthless, when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. So your faith that has been deposited in Christ has a result of justification and receiving righteousness. And so that's what we've been looking at. That's what we've looked, up, looked uh, at up to this point. So it's great that we're not guilty, and it's great that we've become righteous, but what is the practical benefit of all of this? And that's what chapter 5 begins to introduce to us, the practical benefit. Now notice in verse 1 here, Romans 5, how he says, Therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the practical ramifications of having faith in Christ and being justified is that we have peace. Now, I want you to notice he says we have peace with God. He doesn't say we have the peace of God. 
The peace of God comes through us uh, abiding in Him. It's part of what happens when we have the fruit of the Spirit that is producing this fruit of peace in our life. He's not speaking concerning that. What he's speaking of is the uh, effect of being justified. You see, before you and I got right with God, the Bible says we were actually in opposition to Him. The Bible says that we were at war with Him, that we have hostility towards God. Uh, we'll see that later on in Romans 5 at verse 10, how he refers to us in verse 10 as enemies. We were enemies of God. And so there is a constant hostile opposition to God. And that's just part of human nature. If God says something is black, we say it's white. If God says something is up, we say it's down. If God says something is sweet, we say it's sour. So we have a tendency of being at war with God. And so the gospel is called the gospel of reconciliation. And the reason it's called the gospel of reconciliation is because God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And because God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, he has given to us this gospel of reconciliation to what we say to people that they can be reconciled to God. And so this gospel is what is called the terms of peace. Because we were at war with God, God has won the war and has given us terms of peace. The terms of peace call for complete and unconditional surrender. It is not one of those surrenders that you actually sit in a council meeting and begin to negotiate what you're going to give up. The gospel speaks of an, a complete unconditional surrender where we say to God, you win and I lose. That's what happens when you repent. That's what happens when you confess your sins to God. You're agreeing with Him. The word confess is the word homologeo. In the Greek, homologeo simply means to say the same thing. If I confess my sin, I am agreeing with God. I'm just saying the same thing. God says, you are a sinner. My confession is agreement with Him. I am a sinner. And it's not a negotiated kind of agreement where I say, well, I'm kind of a sinner because I have done some things, but you have to take into consideration that I wasn't raised right or I came from a, a hard family. I don't know what love is. I'm not educated. It depends on my neighborhood or my ethnicity. It's none of that. It's simply me saying, God, I'm guilty. I have sinned. Forgive me. I agree with you. So I'm not negotiating a peace with him. I'm surrendering to him. When I surrender to him, I can be reconciled to him. And so that's what the Bible talks about when the Bible talks concerning the fact that we need to be justified by faith and we can have this peace with God. Psalm 7 verse 11 says, God is a just to judge and God is angry with the wicked every day. So the wrath of God abides on those who are rejecting him and there is a hostile opposition to him. Then I hear that gospel message where it says, God loves you. God sent his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross for you. God's standard for you to enter into heaven is perfection because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You have failed. You have failed in thought. You have failed in word. You have failed in deed. You have completely failed to meet the standards. Jesus never did. So by faith, I accept what has been done on my behalf through Jesus Christ. And by faith, I say, God, forgive me, a sinner. Wash me and cleanse me by the blood of Jesus Christ so that I might stand before you justified in Christ, reconciled to you, no longer in opposition to you. I am no longer in war with you. So that's the peace he's talking about. In verse 1 again, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Now after I have the peace with God, then I can enter into having the peace of God. And that passes all human understanding. So we have peace with God. What that does is that results in a present tense sense of assurance. That's the peace that each person longs for that comes through complete surrender and only comes through complete surrender to him. Someone once wrote, if any man is not sure that he is in Christ, he ought not to be easy one moment until he is sure. Dear friend, without the fullest confidence as to your saved condition, you have no right at all to be at ease. And I pray you may never be so. This is a matter too important to be left undecided. 
And so we can have peace with God. And that's the only way you can have peace with God is by completely surrendering to him. So when that happens, verse two says, uh, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So by faith we obtain the favor of God and we are justified in him. And now we have, notice the word access, we have access. That speaks of direct access or communion. We have access by faith in Jesus Christ. I can now approach the throne and obtain mercy from him. And I want you to notice this. This is an important thing. It's not just a, an afterthought. I want you to see it. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. When I was growing up, I was raised by a mama who loved me and did her best for me. She wanted me to have faith in God, so she encouraged me to go to church and all, and went with me. Uh, she would take me to church. Some of my uh, memories of my mom in the early days is how she would take us to church and all. And uh, my mom was trying to teach me something about prayer. I still remember this lesson, and I don't know what your religious background is. Perhaps you don't even have one, or maybe you had a, a Baptist or Presbyterian or Pentecostal, whatever. My background was Roman Catholicism. So my mom wanted to teach me prayer, and she wanted me to learn to pray to Mary. So my mom said, if you have a request to take to God, you go through Mary. And I said, why? And I was like seven years old, why? She says, because Mary will take your request to God. She said, it's like this, David. She said, you know how that your dad's at work and is busy and you have a need, so you bring it to me and then I bring it to your dad? And I said, yes. She says, well, that's how it is with Mary. What you do is you take your need to Mary and Mary will take it to the Father. Well, from, from my perspective, that made some sense. But then I got saved. And when I got saved, I started reading the Bible to see what the Bible has to say about my prayer requests. Who do I take them to? Because I kind of figured that if God gave us the Bible, I ought to follow it, especially as it relates to those kinds of things, right? I mean, that just made sense to me. I was 20 years old, no genius, but made sense to me. The Bible says it, I ought to do it. And so I start reading the Bible. I read John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There's one God, one mediator between man and God, and that is the man of Christ Jesus. And I discovered that there's only one way that I get to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. And so it's not that my mom intentionally was lying to me or deceiving me. My mom was giving to me what she had received from hers, from her family. And so I have never condemned my mom for giving misinformation. But it was misinformation because the Bible makes it clear that I stand in grace through Jesus Christ that I have access to God by faith in Jesus Christ. Now somebody immediately says, I've had this said more than once, so that means you don't honor the Virgin Mary, right? That's why I have a problem with you Protestants. Well, one, I don't call myself a Protestant, I call myself a Christian, and two, I do honor the things that the Virgin Mary said. All I need to do is look into John chapter two. When I look at John chapter two, I see a wedding feast at a place called Cana of Galilee. And I see that Jesus is there with some of his men, and his mother is there also. I see that she walks up to her son, Mary, walks up to Jesus and says to him, they have no wine. And then I see Jesus' response where he says, woman, what have I got to do with you? My time has yet to come. It has not come. And then I see what Mary says. And so Mary says, whatever he says to you, do it. So when I speak to those who would argue and say, you don't honor, I say, I, I honor because she said, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he will not enter or see the kingdom of God. I honor him. Jesus said, there's only one way to the Father, and that is a man, Christ Jesus. I honor that. See, so that's how you do it, because the word of God tells me that I am saved by grace. I am saved through faith. I am saved and now can enter into the presence of God himself through Jesus Christ. Not through some man, not through some saint, not through even the mother of Jesus. I come to God, I can come to God through Jesus Christ himself. That's what the Bible teaches in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. 
Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So through Jesus Christ, and that's what Paul is saying here, I have access. I have direct communion by faith through faith in Jesus Christ. I can go and see the, speak to the Father through prayer. Now, notice in verse 2, he says, We now by faith stand in grace and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So he says, we stand in grace. That word stand is a Greek word that carries the connotation of a settled condition. It speaks of permanence. He's saying it's God's grace that makes us secure in salvation. It's not my continual attempt to make myself acceptable to God by the things that I'm doing. It's the grace of God that makes it possible for me to have a relationship with him, and I stand firmly in his grace. And it's God's grace that makes me secure. In Philippians 1, 6, it says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so the result of standing in grace is rejoicing in hope. And when he speaks about rejoicing, that word rejoicing speaks of a jubilant rejoicing. We are excited about the future. Hope is made up of desire for something and an earnest expectation of obtaining it. Sometimes people have what there's a common say, saying, they have a fool's hope. Because it isn't really something that you can actually ever obtain. True hope is when you have a confident expectation of obtaining something that's been promised to you. And so I have a hope. I have a hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I look at the world and I don't have hope in the world. When I was a hippie in the 60s, ancient history time, when I was an ancient hippie, uh, we used to say there's no hope without dope. <laughs> we, were, we were the dopes. But we would say there's no hope without dope, man. And, and, and that's kind of, that really was my creed. That's really what I thought. You know, you know, little marijuana will get you a long way and things like that, you know. And so I used to really think that way. But not anymore because I, I, I can rejoice in hope, a confident expectation, and I should because my destiny, what God is doing in my life, what he's, what he's intending for me, my destiny is to share, think about this for a moment, and Paul is teaching this, to share in the glory of God. That's your hope a confident expectation. You are going to be conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We're going to see him as he is. We are going to be conformed into his image. Our whole lives are going to be transformed and glory is going to be what we have. And we have that through the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be glorified. And then we're going to be on display for God's glory. It says in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. We will receive glory. We will be glorified. We'll be living in heaven with the Lord and we'll be having fellowship with God and, and all those who love him for eternity. What a glorious thing for us. That's your future. That's what's awaiting you if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. What a, what a future. Yes, I think you should clap for that. That's a great thing. Now, with that said, he goes on to give some practical applications because in verse 3, he says, not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Yes, we're going to be glorified, indeed, but we glory in tribulation. Because we know that tribulation is going to produce something. Tribulation produces, he says, perseverance. The word tribulation speaks of pressures. And he's saying, we know that God's plan for us is good, and therefore we can glory in the midst of the pressures of life. Because we know that pressures are simply part of the life that we live. Jesus prepared us for that. 
Jesus made it clear that we would go through difficult times. I used to wish that I could get up and I could say to you, listen, if you don't know Christ, get saved. You'll never have another problem in your life. I can't do that. I can't do that. I had a guy I used to work with. His name was Gus. And Gus was speaking to me one day, and I was sharing the Lord with him, and he said to me, well, you're a Christian. You took the easy way out. I said, you don't know anything about Christianity, man. I said, no, you don't take the easy way out, Gus. It doesn't work that way. I said, because we have something called the flesh, and it's easier for me to live according to the flesh than it is to die to it, I tell you that. It's easier for me to give in to temptation than it is to resist it. It's easier for me if I'm upset about something or hurt about something. It was a lot easier for me to go out and buy a six-pack and drink it than it, was, than it is to just say, Lord, give me strength. I have to get through this. Because my habit in the past was, should I have pressure, just get drunk. Should I have pressure, just get loaded. That was my habit. But now that I'm saved, I can't yield to the temptations of the flesh, the inclinations of the flesh. I have to die to those things. So no, it's not easy. I didn't take the easy way out. You know, for me, as a young man, if somebody bothered me, it was easier for me to get angry than it is to turn the other cheek any day of the week. It's a lot easier just to, to just vent, to say what's on your heart, what's on your mind, just to give them a piece of your mind. It's a lot easier to do that than it is to, to bite your tongue and say, God, help me. I don't want to offend with tongue. I don't want to say something that is wrong here. God, help me. It's a lot easier just to give in and to vent my flesh than it is to die to it. So no, I didn't take any easy way out because Christianity is the way of death. When Christ calls a man, he bids a man come and die. That's what he calls us to do, to die to ourselves. It's not easy. Is it easy for you? It isn't easy for me. I mean, people come into church, understand that, because even on your way here sometimes, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, you wanted to be here first service, you third service people. <laughs> It didn't work, did it? The kids were all dressed up, and they decided to go out and make a mess of themselves. Then you had to wash them up, clean them up. You had to recomb their hair. And then you get, and oh, we'll go to second service, and then something happens second. Now you're here in third service, and on the way here, as you're driving here, and the kids are making noise in the back seat, and you're saying, if I could only reach you, I, I, I'll be fixing you right now. And you're all mad. And you're raising your voice, but something happened when you hit the driveway. Because you were doing this, and then all of a sudden you hit the driveway and you... <laughs> we're in church, oh praise the Lord. <laughs> Which is why it's difficult for you to worship. And then you listen, and then you go home and say, oh, by the way, I'm not through. That was just an intermission. We haven't dealt with it. So what is easier, dying to self or venting the flesh? But you know what? The Bible teaches us very clearly that we can glory because God produces through tribulation something we would have no other way, and that's called perseverance. And God gives us strength. Jesus said in John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we can glory in tribulation because God uses those things to refine us. We can rejoice because hardships are evidence of faithful living, which is blessed and rewarded by God. In 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, Paul said it like this. He said, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, Paul says these tribulations ultimately produce spiritual benefits. And when we are armed with that kind of mindset, we can endure, we can persevere through pressure. Because we're looking to the future, and that enables us to endure the present. 
In Romans 8, 18, Paul said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance is the ability to overcome. It gives you that strength to endure in the face of opposition. It is a calm temper that suffers evil without murmuring or discontent. It's developed as we wait on the Lord and as we learn the lessons that he wants to teach us. It is one of the distinguishing marks of maturity in the Lord, perseverance. I have been young and now I am old. And I can speak from experience of 42 years of following Jesus that when I was young, I would say, God, give me patience now. I didn't want to wait for it. I wanted it now. God producing me now. And so I've learned over the years that God has to do a work that sometimes takes time. If you go out and you plant a flower or you plant a tree or whatever, you know that if you go out and you get a one-gallon uh, tree and you drop it in the ground, you know that the next day you come out, you don't come out there with a, a bag expecting to pull off the oranges. You know it's going to take some time, three to five years probably, till it starts producing the way that you would like it to do. So you plant in hope, don't you? You plant with this knowledge that I'm planting a seed right now, but it's going to take some time for that to actually grow. Or I'm planting a small tree here, but I know in time it's going to grow. It takes time. So you patiently wait for that because you know that fruit takes time. You know that. We know that in nature, but we don't know that in the spiritual. We don't realize that there are some things God wants to do in us that actually simply take time. So you learn that as you grow up. You learn that as you grow older. You learn that through experience. You know that God is always on time exactly at the moment he needs to be there. And yet I'm saying, oh, Lord, have you given up on me? Oh, God, where have you gone? I don't know what you're doing. How can you put me in this position? I don't believe you love me anymore. And I complain against him. And I say, Lord, you, you really cared for me. You wouldn't have done this or you wouldn't have done this. And you let that happen to me. And I don't understand why. And the Lord says in his still, small voice, shut up. <laughs> you whine too much. Oh, Jesus, you say. I want to have children. <laughs> God says, no you, you, no, you really don't want that. No, I do. You know, I want to, like a living little doll, I can dress them up and take them out, and they're just a, little, a lot of fun, and, oh, Lord, I want a child. Uh, are you ready for one? Yeah, well, I am, I am. Baby's born. It's a cute little thing. Usually they're not when they're born. Usually when they're born, you say, oh, woof. <laughs> Ooh, this is ugly. Whew. I hope it outgrows this. Look at that old head. That head's all like that, you know. So, but they actually fill in. The head gets around. And then you, they're little and they, they love you and they're dependent on you. And they learn how to say mama or daddy. They start reaching to you when you put your hands out to them. Oh, and you hold them and... And then there's a husband, you hold them, they make a mess, and you hand them to the wife, say, hey, they're calling you. <laughs> and that goes on for the first year, two years. They begin to walk, they begin to speak. Pretty soon it's time for them to go to school, and you dress them up, send them to school. You worry about them. Are they going to be okay? Everything's going to be fine. You pick them up, bring them home. You bring them into the house. You say to them, okay, do your homework, or go and clean your room. They're little, and they say, yeah. And they do it, and everything's fine. And so you look at people, and you, they've got older kids, and you say, I don't understand how your kids became like that. Look how good my kids are, and then something happens at 13. <laughs> you know, it's been said that when Abraham was commanded to give Isaac up to the Lord to kill him, that um, it was difficult for him because Abraham was going to be putting to death a son who was probably 30 years of age. Probably would have been a lot easier if he was 13. Because, because something happens. And all of a sudden, this little angel who used to sit there and do exactly what you wanted begins to develop their own mind, right? 
and you watch them do these things. And before you know it, they just don't want to do what you're saying. And then pretty soon they're 16 and they're going to be driving the car and they're going to stay out late. And then you're staying up late praying and saying, oh, God, where are they? They come home. You have your arguments and, and all of this. And you're thinking, I don't know. I don't know. Lord, you said this child was a gift. Do you have a gift exchange? Is there some way that I can, you know, you know? any way at all and and you wonder what happened what happened this little kid who liked to dress so well and always had everything was so modest all of a sudden they come walking into the house and their their pants are past their underwear and they go oh, and they think they're cool like, what happened what happened to you you were so cute and i got all those things all over your head you know you set off metal detectors I can speak from experience. I can. So can my mom. I can speak from experience. There's a time that happens in most of our lives. Not all. I have, I have friends. One friend. One friend. <laughs> I can't even do the plural. One friend who's had great, great kids as long as I've known him. Unbelievable. The rest are like ours. You fall on your face sometimes at night and you pray. You say, God, I dedicated this child to you. Do you want him back? <laughs> and you hold on. You persevere. You hold on. Because what has brought me through, and I can speak this now with experience, my kids are not children anymore. They're all adults. Train up a child and the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Pour into them the word, pour into them prayer, pour into them love. Never, never, never give up. Hold fast, because God has something good in store for them. They may be fashioning, amen, amen. They may be fashioning their testimony. I wanted to save them from having one like mine. I wanted them to have a different testimony, but they're fashioning their own. But I have a God. I have a God I trust in. And I know my God is able. And that's what you learn that's called perseverance. You hold on and you don't let go. You wait on the Lord if it takes a week if it takes a month, if it takes a year, if it takes 10 years, if it takes 20 years, you hold on and you don't let go. And some people have prayed for their children and they died on their deathbed still lifting their children in prayer. There are last sayings of certain saints, their prayers were for their children and their children were there watching the father die and he dies and the child comes to faith after the father died. His prayers were answered, not in his lifetime, but they were answered. So you hold fast as a Christian. Don't let go. Trust the Lord. You're going through tribulations. God hasn't abandoned you. God loves you. God is with you. He knows all things. He's everywhere at one time, and he's all-powerful. And he is there with you now. He's able now, and he's aware of you now. And if you can grab hold of that, you will make it. You will make it. You will be on the other side, and you will know that God was true to his word, because he is. And whatever you go through and stresses you out and, and causes you tribulation and pain, at the end you will not complain about it, because what has happened with me in my walk with the Lord is he has strengthened me and made me even more determined to see him glorified. And that is a mark of maturity in James 5, verses 10 and 11. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Hold on. Perseverance goes on to forge character. Character that he's speaking about here is a Greek word that means a proven character, a character that has been revealed under fire. 
Long testings have a way of revealing what we really are on the inside. And when we endure and are victorious in them, it reveals the genuineness of our faith. So you are going to be tested. And your, your faith will be refined as by fire. That's what Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it is tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And so our character is refined and we become that person we wanted to be. I have prayed, and I'll say this briefly from the time that I was first saved, because, because I was just, just mean. I was just a mean person. Not a violently mean person, just a mean person. And I've been praying for 42 years. God, please help me to be kind. Help me to be gentle. Help me to be loving. Help me to be those things. That's what I see Jesus to be. That's what I want to be. And the Lord does refine you over time. He does produce that in you. It does happen. It produces, this character will produce a hope. This hope that we have is in God. We discover that God is faithful. We discover he performs according to his promises. And during the time of pressure, our gaze will be directed to another place that's better than this one. It's like what it says in Psalm 31, 24. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Now hope, he says in verse 5, does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Hope does not disappoint. Hope does not disgrace. Hope does not make you ashamed. A hope not based on the stability of God's promises will lead to shame because the hope was placed in that which we simply could not obtain. But the believer's hope is firmly established on God's goodness as well as his truth. And our lives become evidence that we have placed our hope and trust in God. And it is not disappointed because God loves us. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I, I know that I've met people in the past who, when you say, you know, God loves you, they'll say, of course. Why wouldn't he? And I say, how many reasons do you want me to give you right now? Some people are so caught up with themselves that they think that they're just the most lovable thing in the world. But those of us who are aware of what we really are, I'm amazed that my wife loves me. I'm amazed that my children love me. I hope they do. I'm amazed that my mom loves me as much as she does. I'm amazed because I know what I am but I'm especially amazed to know my God loves me. And the love of God has been poured out by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that person of the Trinity that I need to work within me because I become the temple of the Spirit of God, which makes Christianity more than just me reading a book and trying to do what the book says. But it's me reading the book, God's book, and him supplying the power for me to do what he says. I become the temple of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God begins to abide or dwell in me. He produces in me what is called the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, and then eight other accompanying virtues that describe that one word. As he produces the fruit of his Spirit in my life, and he seals me to the day of redemption, he also empowers me by his spirit, giving me gifts that I can use that perform spiritual ministry to help others to have relationship with him and develops me into a mature believer. All of this comes because he's lavished on me his spirit, which has produced as its earmark the love of God. I need to be saturated by the Spirit of God, so that I might be able to be manifesting the character of God to the world and express through his gifts the power of God through my life. Paul says in verse 5, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given, who was given to us. Poured out. The Holy Spirit has been poured into us 
the love of God has been revealed in us by the power of that Holy Spirit. If there's anything that the church needs to remember today in our last days is that we need the power of God. We need the power of his spirit in our lives. Because if you're frustrated trying to live for God right now, it may be because you're trying to live in your own strength. You're just trying to do the best you can in your own power. But I've discovered that God begins to release his power when I come to an end of myself and I say, I cannot do this. I need your help. I can't do this. The will is with me. The ability to perform that which I desire is not. God, you need to help me. So I want to rely on your spirit and I need your work. And then he works in you and produces in you love. And if there's anything that this world needs to see today, it's needing to see loving Christians. By and large, many people already know that the things that they're doing are pretty much wrong. And a lot of times they don't need me or people like me to point my finger at them and to point out every single thing that they're doing that is wrong. Sometimes what they need from me is to love them in spite of the fact that they're doing what is wrong. Not that I give approval because I don't, because Jesus died on the cross to set them free from that. But at the same time, taking into consideration there, but for the grace of God go I, I'm no better than they. And I haven't been ever in my life. I'm simply a sinner in need of a savior. And my savior has saved me and I want others to be saved too. So it's not an attitude of judgmentalism. It's gonna be an attitude of redemption and desire to see people right with God, to see their lives changed, transformed, to see them blessed, to see them forgiven. Because when you see someone who's come to Christ change, especially men, when you see men change, especially husbands and fathers, that husband and that father has a tendency of influencing the whole house. You can, you can win a, a wife to the Lord, and that's a great thing, bless Jesus. She has a certain amount of influence. But when that man gets saved, the house changes. The house begins to change. Because that man takes upon himself that role that God gave to him to be that influence. And those children begin to follow the lead. They may rebel at first, and they may rebel for a long time. But they will say, something happened to my dad. He's different. He's not the same guy. Something happened to him. And men, we do have tremendous influence. When God pours his love and his spirit into our lives, we can influence tremendously our families. But every believer needs to be an influencer. Every one of us needs the power of the spirit. Every one of us needs to walk in grace. So what have we seen? Well, we see that being filled with the Holy Spirit establishes us and strengthens us. It gives us confident assurance that we're justified by God. We have discovered that we have peace with God. We rest firmly in our being reconciled to him through Jesus. We have security and salvation. We stand in his grace. We can rejoice about our future, knowing that we will receive glory. We can endure under pressure because our faith is being refined. And we know that God's love for us and our love for him produces by his spirit an inner peace, a joy that sustains us in the midst of anything that we ever go through. And this all comes back down to having been justified by faith and having peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how it happens.